to uh, Ditch Digger CEO. We're happy to have you here today and uh, excited to uh, tell your story. Well, I'm, I'm happy to be here, Gary. Thanks for having me on. Now, uh, we, what, we usually just start from the beginning, right? We, we, we like to hear about the story of the, the individual and where you, you, know, where you uh, started in life and uh, you know, what your first opportunities were in, in entrepreneurship and all these things. So if you can just right. kind of start from the beginning, because the beginning is an awesome story for, for France. Well, thank you. Um, so if we go all the way to the beginning, uh, I was born in 1973 in uh, Saigon, Vietnam. Oh, wow. And I was uh, very fortunate. My mother uh, worked for the U.S. Naval Attaché. My father was a South Vietnamese Army officer. And in the spring of 1975, uh, we left Saigon in a big hurry uh, because that's what you do when communist forces are taking over your home country. So one day uh, in the in April of that year, um, a U.S. official came to my mom and said, look, we think that it's best that your family leave the country, and we think it's best that you do that as soon as possible. And that was part of a glorious and kind of forgotten chapter of American history called Operation Frequent Wind, when the United States government decided to evacuate over 130,000 Vietnamese for, um, allies of, and friends of, of the United States to the United States rather than leave them behind. And my family was one of those fortunate families that was evacuated as part of that. Wow. And so, what, what was it called one more time? Operation Frequent Wind. Wow. They really should make a movie out of it. I mean, some incredible stories. The United States, you know, it took people out by plane, including my family. They sent ships out to sea. Uh, Vietnamese were loading up their uh, families into helicopters and planes and just taking off east, not knowing if there's anything out there. Can you imagine, right, putting your entire family into a plane and just piloting it out to sea in the hopes that something's there? And there was. Wow. There was American ships sent by sent by our government to receive those folks. And one wow. of my favorite pictures from that time is a picture of U.S. Navy sailors pushing Huey helicopters over the side of ships to make room, more room, so that Vietnamese could wow. land their helicopters. Wow, think about plane. that. Pushing them over right. the side. Yeah, pushing them over the side. You know, this multi-million dollar helicopter is not as important as as a human life. That's awesome. So, That's amazing. You know, so my family went from uh, from Saigon. We flew out on a C-141 Starlifter, courtesy of the U.S. Air Force, and came to Guam, where a, a resettlement camp was being set up. We processed there. Um, in fact, I I even have a an immunization record all the way, dating all the way back to the island of Guam. It's one of my earliest pieces of paper wow. in my possession. And then from there flew to Camp Pendleton, California, uh, which was the first of four different resettlement camps set up for the Vietnamese um, refugees, as they were called, uh, coming into the United States. And it was there that uh, the story becomes interesting. Governor Brown, the then governor of California, didn't want the Vietnamese refugees to stay in his state. In fact, he sent folks out to actually stop the planes from landing. Governor Evans of Washington State, excuse me, Governor uh, Brown of California, Governor Evans of Washington State heard of this and says, well, what's up with this? So he sends his aide, Ralph Monroe, down to these camps at Camp Pendleton, where my family is. And, and Ralph reports back to the governor, like, these are a bunch of, you know, people who are trying to make a new life for themselves. And, uh, Governor Irwin says, you know what, we should do something to help them. And so he set a call out that says, look, if anybody wants to come to Washington State, we'd welcome you. And so my family was one of those that answered the call and uh, ended up settling in a small town in Washington State called Tumwater, Washington, uh, which is the home, by the way, of, of Olympia Beer back in the day. Uh -huh. And uh, and I grew up in a, in a small town, America, one high school town, lots of football, um, lots of beer back then as well. Uh, and... Uh, by the way, recently connected for the first time with both Governor Evans and Ralph Monroe, which was uh, really, really cool and, and very emotional for me. Wow. Now, now, now you were only like two years old when your family came over. Is that right? Yeah, I was 18 months old at the time. So you don't like you don't remember any of this at all? No, this is all stuff I learned after the fact. But it was, you know, it was learning about that, actually, Gary, that inspired me to want to serve. And uh -huh. so growing up, you know, learning about my family's history, I really began to feel like I, I had a debt that needed to be repaid, you know, a debt to right. the United States as a country for giving me and my family these wonderful opportunities to the military for having brought us out of, of the country and rescuing us. And so I thought, what better way to repay that debt than by serving 
that very same country and by serving in that same military. When, when, so, when was your uh, vision for that? When did you start thinking, boy, you know what? I, I, I got to give back. I got to be part of this, this great country in a bigger way. And when, when, when did you have, how, at what age were you, were you thinking this way? Yeah, I, I think from a very early age, I, I felt this, this, the sense that I needed to do something. I think as I got older, it crystallized. And by the time I was a, a teenager, I felt a strong desire to serve. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, that led me in my, my senior, you know, junior and senior year applying to and receiving an appointment to the United States Military Academy at West Point. Oh, that's awesome. It's amazing. That's not just awesome, man. That's just not easy. That's it's not, not easy. That's not easy. You had to, you had to uh, re- really, con- you know, understand what how you had to be ready for that. You know, understand you know what type of grades you'd have to have, community service, um, leadership, and sports, or or anything else, right? You, you you must have understood this in your early teens then, and then and then went after it, or what? So I, I was a pretty driven teenager uh, for a whole host of reasons, um, but I think like many people who end up. Uh, you know, on a, on a path that leads them to, to doing things that, you know, helps them realize their dreams. Uh, I was very fortunate in the sense that I had mentors along the way. And, uh, one of my early mentors was uh, Lieutenant Gen- General Howard Stone. Uh, he used to command what was then Fort Lewis. Um, he actually connected with me in high school and, uh, encouraged me and kind of helped me understand, you know, what the path to West Point looked like and, and shepherded me along the way. So I'm ver- very thankful to him. Absolutely, that's that's really cool. I mean, just that just the opportunity to have somebody you know kind of kind of tell you the path or or give you the you know the uh, you know the, the the roadmap right is was pretty cool. And 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 someone who believes in you, right? I mean, mm-hmm. when you're, I mean, I guess not even when you're young. I think at any age in life, right? There's when you're embarking on something new. There's always self doubt. Um, you know, teenagers in particular, right, have a lot of angst, and so having a a general, a three-star general, look at me and says, "France, you can do this." Um, you know, it made me believe that was true. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have, I have some, you know, similar experiences in, in in high school that just gave me confidence I wouldn't have had otherwise with a coach that that made me the captain of the wrestling team, and then the coach that made me the captain of my football team. You know, there were these people that have confidence in me when I didn't probably think I could actually do it, and it wouldn't. I, I didn't raise my hand. They they came to me. Which was which is awesome, right? So they, gosh, if they think I can do it, maybe I can, right? And that same confidence helped help carry me into the business in, into business out of high school. But for you, you know, that that same confidence inspired you and 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 gave you the roadmap to say, man, this guy, this general thinks I can do it. I can do it. That's that's amazing. So tell us tell us how that went. Now, okay, so high school. Now you're an athlete as well in high school, weren't you? I was a. Well, to be honest, I was more of a mathlete than athlete. I'm a, I'm a late blossomer when it comes <laughs> right. to never heard that when it comes before. to physical fitness. Um, you know, to be honest, uh, I, I wasn't even a good swimmer. Um, you know, the reason I went to West Point and not the Air Force Academy or, or Navy <laughs> was I had bad eyesight and I couldn't swim. So Whoa. that kind of you know limited my service academy options to the thing that I thought was land based. I was very surprised <laughs> to find out when I went to West Point that one of the graduation requirements is actually to pass swimming. Uh, um, and there's various levels of swimming classes. Uh, the level of swimming classes I took was referred to as rock swimming, and you can guess why. <laughs> um, I, I barely made it out of swimming class, uh, and my classmates barely made it out of it with me. I nearly drowned the entire class during a couple of different classes, I think. But you, but you, you could dog paddle well enough to get through it. I, I can I can side stroke well enough in, in a pinch. So, uh, <laughs> okay. So yeah. So we, when you when you got to West Point, tell us a little bit about that and and, and how that took you a little further in your leadership mindset. Yeah, West Point. Uh, there's a saying about West Point. It's a it's a great place to be from. It's not always a great place to be. Um, mm-hmm. It's a hard place, right? I mean, West Point was was our is the oldest, longest continuing operating military base. It was uh, founded uh, originally as a f- Fort to protect the great chain spread across the Hudson River to protect it against the British ships. So it was designed to be remote and hard to reach and easy to defend. Um, okay. All those things are still true today. Uh, West Point is a remote place. Um, and when you're a cadet there, um, it becomes your world, right? And, and that's, that's good in the sense that you get, a, you, know, you get to focus really strongly on the things that you should be doing, which is preparing yourself to be you know, a, a leader of character for the nation, um, and to serve as a junior officer in the United States Army. 
uh, it can be tough, right? Because, you know, your friends and family are far away and, you know, you hear tales about what your high school friends are doing at their civilian universities and you're like, wow, you know, yesterday I had an inspection and I got yelled at because my toothbrush was in the wrong place. So, uh, but, you know, you know, hard, hard times um, produce the opportunities for, for great character and, you know, West Point is the preeminent, preeminent, excuse me, uh, leadership and character building institution, uh, I feel, um, in the world. And so for me, it was, it was a beautiful, remarkable four years. Um, you know, West Point forces a whole development of person, leadership, physical, um, and character development. Um, and, uh, as well as academic development and, you know, in all those areas, you know, I kind of jumped in with two feet. What were the what were the main values uh, as a West Point uh, cadet what that, that you had to live by and understand why they're so important? Yeah, there's uh, this is well known to all West Point graduates out there. Uh, MacArthur gave a speech, one of his last speeches, and he talked about the importance of duty, honor, and country. Right, that that that's that sense of duty, you know, doing what needs to be done, you know, a sense of honor, doing what's right, choosing the harder right over the easier wrong, right, and and service to country, in in all its many forms. So duty, honor, country. I mean, that, and that's, that's it. And and uh, it's pretty simple, right? I mean, and 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 as far as on a daily basis, I mean, you, you had you had to know it, live it. I mean, talk it. What? Yeah, absolutely. They they gave you many chances. You you studied it, you learned it, and then, like you said, most importantly, you lived it. Right. Um, you know, everywhere around West Point are you know inspirations of of those values. I still remember one time walking into the the cadet library, and there's a case there, and it contains rings um, from past classes. West Point, by the way, was the very first college to have class rings. It started the tradition of class rings, and this this ring case has class. Uh, has rings from every class dating all the way back to the founding of West Point in 1802. And then you look in the ring case, as I was doing, and you notice that many of the rings are actually in really bad shape. They're they're busted up. They're missing their stones. They look like they've had some rough times. And you're like, well, that's kind of odd. And then you read underneath each ring, and it's got a name and a date of birth and a date of death. Mm-hmm. And you realize that most of those rings in those case had been uh, donated to the academy after their wearers had been killed in combat. Wow. And, you know, to walk in and be realized, like, that's part of the tradition, right, that you become Mm -hmm. a part of when you become a cadet at West Point, right? Duty, honor, country. You know, our graduates go on and serve, you know, and live those, you know, it's just not eyewash. You you live those values and and you, you live them, you know, perhaps, you know, to the day that you make the ultimate sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And, um, made, made a strong impression on me as a, as a young cadet to, to see that kind of symbolism um, and reality at the academy, and and how do you live those uh, those values today in your life? Do you do you still you know live by those as well as others? And you know when when you think about what you do today, yeah. I look, I, Gary. You and I have talked about this in the past. Uh, I think one of the the key pieces of success for any organization, right, is to have a values based culture, mm-hmm. and and not just to make. And and you don't do that by just writing words on a sheet of paper and say, hey, these are our values today, right? I mean, every company has a culture. Um, if you don't build one, right, you have one because it's been created, whatever is there from the bottom up or whether driven from the top down. Mm-hmm. Um, values start at the top. Um, they start with the leader right, and the leadership. Um, and But everybody can have an have an impact on their on their organization's values. And so I try to, I you know, I believe those words, you know, um, you know, Schwarzkopf came and gave a speech at West Point uh, the year before I showed up and he talked about how duty on our country, you know, he heard the speech and they weren't just words to him that he, he believed them, right? Like this isn't just something that, you know, was far off and intangible. Like these were, these are real living values that, Mm -hmm. that he embraced. And, and I, I, I agree with him. Um, to this day in the companies that I'm involved in and the organizations I'm involved in, you know, um, I try to make sure that a, I set the example in terms of the values by which I, I live by and b use those values, um, in the decision-making that I often called on to do and see, I, I try to refer to them, right. Try to talk about them so that their people understand the importance of those values. Sure. 
I, I love it. I love it. And take some, it takes a long time sometimes to figure that out in business. And if you start from scratch, and it took me probably 20 years to really figure that out. So, so for for young listeners that are listening to this that are starting their business today, right? Start out with those values right off the bat, right? Don't wait. You know, find find the values that really suit you, and and build your business on those values now, right? And they may they may you may pivot here or there as time goes on, and you grow into a different type of business maybe or um, serving different type of people. But it's important, right? Um, yeah, I when, couldn't agree more, Gary. When you when you so when you uh, when you, when you enter so so you're, you you graduate from West Point, um, uh, you know, f- in top of your class, and you won't talk about it, but uh, top top one percent of your class or how, whatever that was is an incredible incredible per- top percent of one percent. That's not bad, uh, but but after you graduated, what what did that then where'd you go next? What was the next phase of your life, and and where did that education take you, and how did the education pay off? So. Typically, what cadets do when they graduate is they take 60 days of what is called graduation leave. So it's the longest break you'll have. You know, normally when you're at the academy, you you stay there um, throughout the academic year unless you're on pass. And in the summertime, you're training except for a short period of vacation. They really don't have a summer vacation from West Point. So mm-hmm. you normally graduate and take 60 days of vacation. Um, in my case, instead, I ended up going to U.S. Army Ranger School, um, <laughs> which is a which is a, uh, you know, 60 some odd day, uh, leadership <laughs> development course, um, held at three locations at the time, Fort Benning, I didn't Delonica, get, Georgia, so you're, so you're like, I, you're like, I didn't get beat up enough. I want more. <laughs> I can't, I can't yeah. go without this. I want more. What's this next thing? Ranger school. That, yeah. that, that's for me. Yeah. Uh, I've, I actually, I clearly have a poorly developed sense of self-preservation. Here. So <laughs> yeah, I, I graduate from West Point. And a week later, I'm I'm at uh, in processing for for Ranger School. Wow! And in fact, some of the RIs, uh, what, RI stands for Ranger Instructor. You know, one of the common things they ask you is like, you know, what unit you're from, and you know, where you've been stationed. And so the instructors looked at me and says, you know, Ranger Hong. You know, what what unit are you are you coming from? And I'd have to respond, Sergeant, I don't have a unit. <laughs> in which case, they would look at me and say, Well, how long have you been in the Army, Ranger? And I'd say something like. Nine days, and then they would just <laughs> crack up. Uh, they're like, "Who is this idiot?" Uh, but it was good. It was good. It was great um, uh, in the sense that I got through it and I got my Ranger tab. It was not great in the sense that it was probably the suckiest sixty days I've ever had. I mean, a lot. I went from I don't know what I entered with, you know, in terms of weight, but I, you know, probably like one thirty-five. I I graduated weighing like one oh five. Oh man. <laughs> Oh, they you know, beat the heck out of you. It was the hungriest, you know, that's when I made that vow, like gone with the wind, right? You know, as God is my witness, I will never be hungry again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, starve you in ranger school. Wow. And, um, but it was also, um, it was a great compliment to West Point. Um, I mean, West Point gives you lots of great opportunities for leader development and to practice leadership. But ranger school, right? Ranger school, you know, is that on steroids? Like, can you lead a group of, you know, your peers, right? So that's the hardest type of leadership. Can you lead mm-hmm. a group of your peers when they're tired and hungry and stressed, right? Can you be that voice of, of command and reason and leadership mm. in the dead of night, right? In the middle of a forest when everything is going to, you know, heck in a handbasket, right? Yeah. Can you make a good decision and can you get other people to follow you? Um, and... You know, there's this joke that you know the reason you go to ranger school isn't, you know, isn't because um, they're preparing you because the combat's so hard, right? It's to make sure that you, you know, you realize it's not as hard as ranger school. So, wow. um, there's some truth to that. Yeah, think about think about that, Q. Leading people, your peers, the same yeah. age as you, right? They're, they've gone through a lot of the same stuff you've gone through. Not easy, right? If you think in, in business, usually it's usually somebody a veteran, somebody that's been doing that business for a yeah. long time that's leading, and you can kind of take that uh, you take that leadership kind of easy. Okay, of course they're leading. They've been doing this for a long time. They know more than me, right? Yeah. Think about having having to be that peer that doesn't have any more real experience than they do, but, but taking leadership role to, to teach that's got to be incredible and to, and to learn and, and do it. It's got to be incredible. Yeah. yeah. F- France, what, what was the, I guess the mindset that you had in order to, um, I guess, get through a lot of specifically that 60 day 
I guess, hail, if you call it that, or, or the range of perspective. The reason I ask that is because if I think of, like, Navy SEALs, you know, they talk about how, you know, a lot of you got these big people, you got all these strong people who think they could be a Navy SEAL, and then they're the quickest ones who ring the bell, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, what was what's kind of the mindset that you had there? Because I'm, I'm assuming that that's also the mindset that you have as far as entrepreneurship. I mean, if you went through what yeah. you went through, I'm pretty sure for you, uh, running a business is is honestly the same so what was that mindset back then no th- those are that's that's excellent that's great there is definitely some parallels there to like being an entrepreneur and being a ranger student um y- the formula is pretty simple you just don't give up right as long as you don't give up then there's a way forward right it may not be easy but there's a way forward the moment you give up you're done um and they know that and it, it, it's interesting because I think in both entrepreneurship and in ranger school, some of the people who are doing the worst, they don't give up and they still find a way forward and they make it, right? Some of the people that are doing the best and you're like, man, you are killing it. <laughs> yeah. Like mentally, they can't hack it, right, for whatever reason, and they throw in the towel huh. and you're like surprised. Um, and they, by the way, the, the ranger instructors knew this. And so they would, you know, they would test you, right? Like you would fail a patrol or whatever, and then they'd pull you aside and be like, you know, hey, Ranger, I know you had a rough day. Tell you what, if you, if you want to quit right now, you can be, you know, in a warm bed, have a hot meal, a shower, <laughs> you know, within four or five hours. I'll, I'll, I'll even tell everybody you got hurt so that nobody will think any less of you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> right? Because they're, they're tempting you, right? They're tempting you with the easy way out, and you've got to mentally decide mm-hmm. that you want this. Right. Um, and it's that kind of grit that ranger school is supposed to develop. And I think it's that same kind of grit you need as an entrepreneur that you just, you just not willing to give up. Now that doesn't mean you should be stupid about not giving up in the sense that like, doesn't mean you keep, you know, you pick a path and you proceed along it. Even if you're, you're hitting every, every obstacle along the way, you got to be smart, right? You've got to take, you got to make calculated decisions and take the right kind of risks and pursue the right kind of opportunities. And, and no one to pivot. That applies to both entrepreneur and entrepreneurship, yeah. but you, you know, the first, the, the key thing is you don't give up. Hey Amen. That's good. Yeah, don't don't give up, but but uh, no one because because sometimes I took that not giving up a little too far when I when I lost money in the business and lost more money in the business and a little more money in the business and I didn't know when to give up and eventually I gave up realizing holy cow I could have gave up a long time ago and lost a lot less money I could have pivoted to another another direction a long time ago and I didn't sometimes right, right? so it's knowing knowing when to pivot right don't give up yes. man but knowing when you got to take another road maybe right. Yeah, and Gary, Gary, I think the key there is you got to define what you're not giving up on, right? What is your end goal, yeah. right? Yeah. Your end goal isn't necessarily to make this business succeed. It's to make the business succeed, right? And that sure. may involve a pivot. That may involve having to step things back and take the leadership team a different direction, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's very important to define what the end goal is absolutely. that you're not trying to give up on. Right. So, so uh, how, how many years were you in the military? And then, and then uh, tell us about that and then the exit and where you went after. Yeah, so I was, uh, all West Pointers have to serve five years on active duty. Um, and so I did. I did my, you know, completed ranger school, did, you know, officer basic. Then I was assigned to Germany, military police platoon, from there deployed to Bosnia, and then went to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where I was the deputy chief of police and SWAT team commander at Fort Leavenworth for a couple of years. Um, that was my first stint in the military, um, had a bit of a break in service, um, uh, was a lawyer for many years, attended Georgetown law school, worked at some law firms, um, clerk for a couple of judges, uh, ended up working as a special assistant and associate white house counsel, um, wow. working, uh, for president George W. Bush from 2000 to 2009. And after my time in the white house, uh, reentered the military, uh, for the second time. And uh, in the summer, or excuse me, in the uh, spring of 2009, and th- this goes back, by the way, Gary, to the theme of having a poorly developed sense of self-preservation, um, <laughs> I, I joined um, a special forces unit that was mobilizing to deploy to Afghanistan um, and served wow. as the company executive officer um, on, a, on a deployment uh, to southeast Afghanistan from 2009 to 2010. Wow. And, and uh, tell us about that a little bit. Tell us what you can tell us about that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there are certain questions I want to ask you, but I'm not going to ask you here. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, it, talk about being entrepreneurial, right? Uh, special forces are kind of like the entrepreneurs of uh, of 
of military operations. They uh, they're also known as Green Berets. Um, so oh, okay. my company of 87 uh, Green Berets had the mission of working by, with, and through our Afghan partners um, to you know af- make quote unquote effects in the battlefield. So what does that mean? Um, my 87 uh, Green Berets that were in the company I was assigned to, um, I was the executive officer. Uh, they were divided into s- six what are called operational detachment alphas, otherwise known as A-teams, mm-hmm. um, as well as one headquarters detachment. Each of those detachments was partnered with an Afghan partner unit of anywhere from 20 to 200 uh, soldiers or police officers. And they trained those partners and then went on combat operations with them. And so we were assigned to a part of Afghanistan that was uh, pretty busy uh, during uh, that time frame, uh, we spent our first six weeks searching for Private Bergdahl when he walked off um, an army installation. Um, one of our installations was also uh, the scene of the uh, suicide bomber attack that mm. was featured in Zero Dark Thirty. Um, our that was just wow. down the road from us, um, but it was you know it's classic special operations um, missions, right? You know, foreign internal defense, you know, capacity building. Um, you know, village medical operations, all the things that um, special operations um, who are amazing, absolutely amazing uh, soldiers do to enable their partners to succeed and build capacity. Sure. Um, uh, so, you know, off of, uh, to a squirrel a bit, but, you know, how many how many lives were lost searching for Bergdahl? W- weren't there lives lost uh, looking for him? Yeah, I don't know the exact number. I will tell you a couple of vignettes from our time. I still remember sitting in uh, our talk, our, our, our ops center, excuse me, our operations center. You know, we, we'd we hear reports, you know, we being U.S. military, we'd hear reports that there was some, you know, white male spotted in this part of Afghanistan, you know, and possibly it could be uh, Private Bergdahl. And so... You know, one of my ODAs and their partner units would be spun up and put on a helicopter and flown to look, and not more than once, right? They would encompl- uh, they would encounter uh, some kind of booby trap, right? Oh, or wow. you know, some kind of nasty surprise waiting for them. In one case, I remember uh, they went into a building and there was a vehicle, and the whole thing had been rigged to blow. Now, why it didn't? You know, it, it, by the grace of God, um, you know, no one was hurt. Um, but I know that, you know, my operators were put very much in harm's way looking for, uh, private Bergdahl, um, because, you know, the, the enemy, the enemy is smart, right? They realize that if they call in a report of, sure. you know, so, here's, here's somebody, whether it's false information or, or not, right. U S military is going to respond. And that was a great way to bring a group of operators and their partners to a certain location where they could plan something. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> they, they know that, uh, you know, American hearts are huge and there's you know, no, no soldiers going to be left behind. Right. Um, and, and sometimes, yeah, that's right. sometimes to, um, to a fault. Yeah. But oh. it was a very, very eye opening. You know, I was on the ground for seven months. It was very eye opening in the sense that, you know, I went from, you know, it had been nine years since I put on a uniform. You know, I was not special operations, so I'm not a Green Beret, but I got to um, got to serve in the role that is normally uh, occupied by a special forces officer, which is, um, unusual and a great privilege. Um, you know, and of course the contrast between what I'd done the year before, you know, I went from picking out neckties for work to picking out hand grenades on patrol. So it was a, wow. a bit of a contrast. <laughs> I guess. So, so that, that ended, you were, you did that for a year? I did that for a year, uh, and then came back, um, while, uh, and, and by the way, I should say, right, for those who are wondering, uh, I did have a bunch of train up, uh, five months of train up and made plenty of mistakes. Um, actually, all my stories I should probably tell you more about. Right. But, you know, plenty of mistakes at West Point, plenty of mistakes in Ranger School, barely graduated, uh, made more than my share of, of mistakes as a as a leader um, with special operations. But going back to what we said before, right, also never quit. You know, try to learn from those things, drive on, be humble about what I could or couldn't do, mm-hmm. and try not to let my ego get in the way of doing the best job I could for the for the men and women you know who I was responsible for. Um, when I was when I was in Afghanistan, I got an email from Joe Fluitt, who I'd worked with at Williams and Connolly, the law firm, 
uh, several years prior. Uh, Joe himself had deployed to Afghanistan in 2005 with the charge to stand up the Afghan Air Force. And so he had gone over and, you know, from scratch, rented helicopters and recruited pilots and, and stood up the special operations aviation wow. wing for the Afghans. But And he comes from a family of entrepreneurs. And so when I was in my closing days of my time in Afghanistan, he sent me an email, says, look, France, I've started two companies, uh, uh, an aerospace company and a law firm. And if you were here, I'd twist your arm and, you know, make you join right away. But you're off doing great and wonderful things for our country. But be prepared for some arm twisting when you get back. <laughs> and so uh, when I got back in spring of 2010, uh, that's when I met up with Joe. Okay. And then, and then Joe had, uh, you're saying a law firm and what other type of business? So it was a, a company called MAG, um, which is a government services company uh, that uh, focuses on providing what we call airborne ISR. Uh, ISR stands for Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance. Um, so it's aerial surveillance work. So it, it operates planes, drones, and helicopters all around the world um, as a service uh, to various customers, mostly the U.S. government, but there are also commercial customers and other friendly foreign governments. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so that was that the business you walked into or you came into then? <clears throat> So I was part of the founding teams of the of the law firm um, F H and H and of of what is now Mag Aerospace. Um, you know, Joe um, made me an offer I couldn't refuse. Um, ironically, I refused it at first. Uh, <laughs> really? So yeah. So I came back with Joe. I came back and Joe was like, "Hey, you know, here's the pitch. Here's the here's the companies I want you to join." And I said, "No." Uh, and I said, "Joe, look, I got I have this whole career path ahead of me as a lawyer." Um, this sounds really risky. I'm not sure if I want to do it. Um, and then I remember walking around downtown DC thinking to myself, why did I say no? And I just kept thinking about it. And then I applied, uh, something I've, I've talked about before, which is the rocking chair test. You know, when you're 98 years old and you're sitting in a rocking chair, mm -hmm. um, on your patio, thinking back on your life, you know, what are the things that you're going to regret not having done? And so the goal is to live life in such a way that there's the fewest number of items, you know, that you're going to regret um, having passed by when you're in that rocking chair at 98. And so I realized to myself that, oh, this, this falls into that. Like, I'm going to regret not having done this. So I called Joe back up and said, look, let's, let's have another conversation. I might have been too hasty. Um, and, you know, I thought to myself, gosh, I just spent the last year, you know, putting myself in in harm's way, you know, I was almost killed by, you know, a rocket, hand grenades, and a wheelbarrow. Um, you know, what's a little bit of financial and, and career risk at this point? And so that's that was the start of my life as an entrepreneur. I, I love the rocking chair scenario. I, I, like I use the deathbed uh, scenario, oh, right? Okay. But I sure like the rocking chair scenario. <laughs> I'm going to change it because of that. I, I always say that, you know, when I'm in my deathbed, whenever that is, right, the last few days of my life, am I going to look back at, at this as uh, something I should have done, right? So, no, that's uh, I'm, I'm going to the rocking chair from now on because I like that. It's relaxing, you know, and you may have a few years left. You're not actually die You're not dead yet. So, no, that's cool. All right, so so when you came back, you so when you did commit, then you came committed to both uh, entities, basically to to be partnered with them in both entities. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's the thing of being a serial entrepreneur, right? I was like, you know what? Let's try being a parallel entrepreneur. Let's see how that goes. <laughs> so yes, so I in an unusual move, um, when I became an entrepreneur, I became an entrepreneur in two companies simultaneously. So I became a partner in the law firm of F H and H, um, and was given, you know, took on the responsibility for branding, marketing, and kind of the growth strategy of the law firm, and then became, um, part of the executive team. And, uh, like I said, part of the founding team of mag aerospace and initially focused on branding, marketing strategy, and all the legal work. How, how big were these companies when you, when you first came on board then? Uh, the law firm had like five lawyers and, um, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars in revenue. Um, Mag was maybe a dozen employees at the time. Uh, didn't matter though, because shortly after I joined, the law firm lost its largest single client. Mm -hmm. um, and within short order, uh, we were, the owners were writing checks to make payroll. And I think to myself, well, this is kind of backwards. I 
became an entrepreneur to make money, and instead <laughs> I'm now putting money into into the company. Um, Mag, likewise, um, lost one of its biggest customers, um, but then within a couple of years had had recovered. But we really didn't have our breakout opportunity. We were we wanted to be an aviation company mm-hmm. um, in the ISR space. Uh, but these, you know, aviation contracts are big. They're complex. They require a lot of capital. Uh, we had the opportunity to get onto an existing contract by purchasing three aircraft on the contract. Mm. Um, but the rub was, um, you know, it would take several million dollars to purchase those aircraft, and nobody would loan us the money, and nobody would invest in in Mag. And so what the founding team did was we emptied out everything we had. Oh, wow. 401ks. Um, we took out second. Some of us took out second mortgages, maxed out credit cards. I think there are a few wives that were not told about empty 401k <laughs> oh, accounts. Oh, man. <laughs> um, I mean, like it was like that scene in a poker game, right? Like all in. All right, right man. Was like, yeah. like the whole founding team, all in. And we, we bought the aircraft. Um, and the real rub was the reason we could buy, one of the reasons we could buy the aircraft was because the contract they were on was about to be canceled. And so not only were we all in, we had to be all in and then convince the customer not to cancel this contract that, that was making money, right, with the aircraft. Otherwise, you know, we would own three very, very expensive paperweights, um, (laughs) instead of having life savings. Um, but, uh, Good news story. Um, we turned around the contract. Um, the customer was very happy, and that was our very first uh, aviation contract. That is and awesome. Was the start of a phenomenal growth by Mag Aerospace, and you know, eight years later, you know, Mag is doing over three hundred million in revenue. Uh, employs over thirteen hundred employees wow. um, on on every populated continent. Um, over sixty contracts for over twenty customers. Um, and currently operates over 200 uh, planes, helicopters, and drones all around the world. Awesome, man, Bear, uh, I, uh, France. I, there's so much that I kind of want to ask you because you just you just kind of summed up so much <laughs> in this small <laughs> sentence. Uh, one of the things that I was thinking about as you were talking about, like literally the all-in philosophy um, as the card of uh, as as the deck of cards, so to speak. And if you're playing poker, and and as, as entrepreneurs, they're they're normally it's at least startups that i've seen or people that's trying to get into business they kind of um well what about this or what about that they're not necessarily all in it seemed like you all had a lot of barriers of entry early mm-hmm. before you got to where you're at what will probably be some you know some i don't want to say mindset but just some things that you think that you all implemented or that you all did to make sure because that was a scary risk i'm not gonna lie to you i i, I mean I, I have no problem going all in you know but then to have no 401k and if it just went one extra way the other way well babe i have something to tell you <laughs> that's not the easiest conversation did i, did so. I tell you about the 401k situation <laughs> honey? That, 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 I, that, I, I didn't say that no uh, so anyway the reason i'm asking that is because i think a lot of people don't know when i mean in your instance it went to the it went mm. the right way um but also the aspect of that's extremely scary to do you know yeah that that's extremely scary. Um, so I think part of being a successful entrepreneur um, is having that idea, right, that you're so in love with, you're so passionate about that you want to be all in. And I I would dare say that you shouldn't be an entrepreneur unless you have that. Mm. If, you, if you don't love your product or service, if you don't feel like it's going to change the world or it's something that's so meaningful to you, that you don't have a choice, right? Like you, you want to create this company so badly, it's not even an option for you. Like this isn't, you know, it's like being in love, right? Like you either know, either you are or you aren't, right? Mm-hmm. So you, if you have to ask the question, the answer is no, mm. right? So if you, if you want to know if you have the right idea to be an entrepreneur, you you know because it's something that you're just you want to be all in. In fact, not only you want, you need to be all in because yeah. you believe in it so much. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're leveraging everything, everything in your life to that point, right? Yeah. To, to go all in, and and if you you really believe in your product, you li- really believe in your service, and you know you're going to work your butt off, right, to make it to make it go, 
you, you do it right. And I, I, yeah. I think you know you you didn't came, come from you know big 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 money or anything, and as well as my, uh, you know myself and a lot of friends of mine that and people we interviewed didn't come from big money. I believe there's there's a advantage in my opinion when when you've had nothing and you've never had a lot to 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 go all in because you the the risk is that you're back to nothing someday and gosh you know what you've been there probably before so not the end of right. the world right I, I think when people yeah, start with a lot and and they're risking giving up the, a lot that they've always had there's that's a little tougher thing in my opinion and and if you get if you get knocked down you don't get back up as easily as if you've been there before yeah yeah a- any day that I'm not an orphan on the streets of Saigon surrounded by communist forces <laughs> right is a is a better day than it could have been. <laughs> So, I might have a low threshold though. <laughs> yeah. uh, so what's no the, so what's the culture like with you all being at three hundred million and and you know over twelve hundred uh, twelve hundred employees? Now, you know, in order to get it to where it was to now, you're at three hundred million and you have amazing contracts. You know, how did you all? What were some things you all implemented to grow to that to that uh, to that staple? Yeah, we were very fortunate. Um, I think the leadership of the team um, were all aligned on culture very early. Uh, um, and the people we hired from the beginning uh, had also bought into the kind of culture we were trying to develop, right? A performance of service driven by a desire to serve our country and do right by our customers, a desire to win, right? Um, you know, we, we, we wanted to win. We wanted to win for our customers. We wanted to win in the business world. Um, and we wanted to, you know, perform. Um, we're a group of folks at MAG who uh, like doing things not just right, but doing things well, mm-hmm. uh, a culture of excellence. And you know, the, the unofficial, and I think later official of mo- motto of MAG was perform or be replaced, um, which, which sounds harsh. And if you talk to Joe Fluid, he, he can give you a whole um, talk about this. But you know, we try to recruit the people that, you know, if you take 10 people in, in a company, you know, in many cases, five people are not pulling their weight, you know, right? three people are, are doing okay, and there's one or two rock stars, right? And they often make up for everybody else. And our, we try to recruit those one or two, and part of our pitch to them was, imagine being in a company where instead of pulling everybody's weight, right, you were struggling to keep up because everyone else was such a rock star as well. Can you imagine being in that environment? And so we brought in people that, like that, that that wanted that kind of high performance culture, um, and then we we enforced it, or we we held people's feet to the fire. We 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 promoted people on the basis of meritocracy, not on the basis of relationship, and then we created um, a brand and marketed that brand based around this idea of kind of high performance. Wow, yeah, and so it's kind of like the you know think of if you evaluate any business or. Um, you know, anything, the 80, 20 rule comes into play very often, right? 20%, mm-hmm. you know, do deliver 80% of the value, right? So, so if you can, if you can get it, if you can get, if you can flip that somehow, that's uh you'll be a high performance team, wouldn't you? I mean, yeah. if you can flip that to 80, 20, but 80, 80% <laughs> drive, you know, hundred percent instead of 20% driving 80%, that'd be a beautiful thing. So that, that's, that's interesting. And, and, and what would you say about uh, perform or what? What did you say before? Uh, perform or be replaced? Or be replaced. I mean, that's that's yeah. kind of a, you know, people people might get offended by that, if that's the, you know, you perform or be replaced, right? Yeah, but, but, but if you're know, blunt. You ask, yeah. Right. But if you ask Joe Fluid, he says, look, that applies to everybody. That's mm-hmm. that's not him saying that to other people. It's him saying to him. That's saying, he's saying that's the company standard. That applies to him. Yes. Right? That applies to every single one of the C-levels, right? That applies to anybody who touches the company, right? Mm-hmm. And he said, and he would say, look, if I'm not performing, I'll be the, fir- you know, I'll be the first person to be replaced. Right. I love it. No, I think if, as long as you're willing to be held accountable to the same standards, there's nothing wrong with it, but you, you got to make that clear. I love it. And then, okay. Right. T- so, so what happened to law firm? Did that, did that go by the wayside or is it still alive? Uh, the law firm, uh, is, uh, also doing well. Um, we're up to, I think 30 lawyers now, uh, based in Tyson's, Virginia, uh, growing, thriving practice over, you know, a thousand clients, uh, you know, continue to, to grow. Um, most recently we added a co-working space, oh. um, a lot for other lawyers to come and work in the law firm space and be part of kind of the extended network, um, associated with the law firm. Uh, mm-hmm. but yeah, the, no, the law firm, uh, continues to, to, to grow and prosper. And, uh, you know, when, when, 
when we brought on private equity to MAG Aerospace in 2013, uh, Joe Fluitt went over full time uh, to to be the CEO of of MAG, and previously he had been splitting time. Um, but I I was the only knucklehead that still thought it was a good idea to be a parallel entrepreneur full time, and so I, you know, I continue to to work at both companies um, since, since their founding. What what are your roles at each company? So with MAG, I'm now as of eight months ago, I've now moved to the advisory board. Um, but at the time that I left, I was serving as the chief strategy officer. Okay. And so I was in charge of marketing, branding, communications. But the bulk of my time was spent on mergers and acquisitions. I was the corporate development officer. And in our last uh, four years at MAG, we did uh, four acquisitions um, that and had teed up a couple more, um, as well as brought on uh, two different private equity groups. And uh you know, that was that was a ton of fun. Yeah. Um, you know, learning how to grow a company and then learning how to acquire companies, bring them in the right way, integrate them in a way that furthers their growth and your company's growth. You know, that's like higher level chess. Um, yeah, no doubt. And so, no doubt. you know, the vast majority of our, our of our growth was uh, was organic growth, but the acquisitions played a key part in bringing us the right. Um, you know, the right people, the right contracts, the right capabilities to to help accelerate that growth. And what about the law, the law <clears throat> excuse me, the law firm and what, what's your roles there? What's your roles and responsibility of the law firm today? Yeah, I'm, st- I'm still a partner and I'm still in charge of marketing, branding and kind of growth strategy. And, um, what I really focus my time on now, um, I, I mean, I have my own practice and I have my own clients that I bring in, but I, what I really, uh, enjoy frankly is finding and recruiting new partners to law firm and helping them Build their practices mm-hmm. and enabling and equipping them to to grow and prosper. How how are you able to manage that? I feel like you know to to be frank, there's a lot of people out here. Oh, I, I need to. Oh man, I can go ahead and I can go ahead and be a videographer. Oh man, I can also be a photographer. Oh yeah, you know, let me all get into. Let me be an actor too. Let me do all three. I'm gonna do it all, and then it just they fall <laughs> right on their face, right on their face. Where we've always yeah. heard, you know. Um, you know, focus. You know, focus on one mm-hmm. course until successful. Hey, I've never, heard, I've never heard that. Nobody's told me that. Oh, well, <laughs> so, but you, you seem that? like well, I don't know, I don't know. But you seem like you're able to do that extremely well. Um, any tips on how you were able to do that and probably have work life balance as well? Yeah, I. Uh, well, first of all, I'm not the man. In any of the companies I'm involved in, okay. right? In other words, I'm I'm not mission critical in the sense that like I'm not the CEO or the COO or I'm not the day to day person because you can't be right. You, if you're going to be involved in multiple enterprises, you can't be the man or the woman that is critical to the functioning of that organization on a day to day basis because there's going to be some point where two different enterprises will need you at the same time, mm-hmm. and what's going to happen, right? There's only one of you. And, you know, so if you're going to be, for example, if you're going to be an actor, right, well, no one else can act for you but you, right? right? You can't be both an actor and run a business where you're the CEO and expect that when you're acting, the company is running fine. Like it's, you know, that those things are kind of mutually exclusive. I mean, I guess you could pull it off, but I think it's at some detriment. So what I am is I am strategic, right? So I add value to the enterprises I'm involved in, in a way that isn't critical to their day-to-day operation. And so that's why I'm able to do more than one, um, one enterprise at a time. Um, second, uh, each of the companies I'm involved in has quote unquote, the man, right. Or the woman, right. The person who is critical day-to-day and they are extremely competent. Um, and so, you know, one of the, the private equity investor we first brought into MAG, um, the co-CEO had a great saying, which is B people hire C people, but A people hire A plus people. Mm. So, you know, my, my goal in any meeting um, organization I'm a part of is I want to be the dumbest person in the room, right? I want to surround myself with better, more competent, you know, more capable people that make me look stupid, frankly. So say that again, B, B people hire C people and A people right. hire A plus people, right? That's right. That's right. Love yep. it. Perfect. Yeah, and 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 it's, and it's so true, right? I mean, um, B people are threatened by by somebody maybe better, smarter, faster, and and an A A person says, "Man, no, bring it on, man! I need, I want, I want more people that are smarter than me," and they're gonna always be an A person because they're finding those people, and their culture is gonna bring those people, right? Compared That's to right. the B person that says, 
you know what? Uh, gosh, I can't can't handle. I can't don't want to hire that guy. He's way too smart. He could take my <laughs> yeah. job, right? So that's a that's a perfect statement. I love it. I love it. And uh, so so tell me about you know the, in this growth. I mean, uh, another challenge of this growth that that I see, France, is you know with that type of crazy growth. You know, some people are are awesome at, at when when you're starting out or in that first let's say you know five, ten, fifteen, twenty million dollar uh, business. But you know, you get to 30, 40, 50, 100 million, you know, 200 million, the same A, the same, uh, I wouldn't say A players because it could be A players, but the same leaders can't can't adjust and can't be the leaders for the future, whether it's, you know, lack right. of continuous improvement or just yeah. just their capacity, right? What? How yeah. do you, how'd you guys treat that along the way? Because like, you had to have that, huh? So this was, you know, this was kind of the, the genius of performer be replaced. While it sounds harsh, right? It also gives you when you say that when you're a small company and you say this applies to everybody then it's no surprise that when you become a hundred million dollar company and one of your senior leaders isn't you know while they were they were capable at their level in a smaller company they're not pulling they're not achieving the same kind of effects you want um you know they may want to be like well look i i started the company right or i'm i'm was here from day one, I should be at this level of stature in the company. You're like, mm-hmm. look, this is all about performance, right? This isn't about, you know, when you came in, this isn't about your relationship with me, right? Or your relationship with the other, you know, founders, you know, it's about performance. Sure. Then you get, this is where we go back to talking about culture and living it, right? Not just having it words on a sheet of paper and we lived it, right? So, you know, yes, so, some people, you know, Joe Fluitt turns out he's a great startup CEO. He's a great growth CEO. And now as he grows an even larger enterprise, right, he's, you know, a phenomenal CEO. Um, that's awesome. You know, there are organizations where that's not the case. Met, yeah. And hopefully the CEO, right, again, this principle of, you know, B higher C's and A higher A pluses, you know, even the CEO should look at themselves and say, you know what, I was great at 50 million. I'm not great at 500. Mm-hmm. You know, I need to step back and be the president of this company or the COO, you know, or onto the board and bring on a professional CEO, right? Absolutely. Who knows how to handle a company this size? Why are you looking at me like that? I, huh? <laughs> Why are you looking at me like that, Q? <laughs> oh, he's giving me a look over here. <laughs> I was I was agreeing with you, France, because it shows a person that can do that also doesn't have an ego. It's, it's not about them; it's about the greater good of everyone else. So um, that's I, right. I thought you were looking at me that looked like you know you need to step aside. No. <laughs> oh, stagnant, let me take over. Like, I, know, guy. I know nothing about paving, my friend. So. <laughs> No, so so um, what, what what do you feel your 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 biggest passion is today in running in, in in strategy and business and all that? I mean, you've gone through so much stuff: private equities, buying, acquiring, right, uh, selling, at stake, probably, right. I mean, where, where's your passion today for the next ten years? So, it's interesting, Gary. When I became an entrepreneur, at first I thought. I was taking a break from service, right? In the sense that like mm-hmm. before that I'd been in, served in uniform, served a country in uniform. I, you know, continue serving as a lawyer by, you know, being an appointee and in, in a white house. And I said, okay, it's time to go make money, right? This is a break yeah. from service. And what I discovered was that great entrepreneurs are also driven by desire to serve, right? They, they have, like I talked about earlier, this desire to serve by making a difference in the world through a product or service that they're passionate about, they believe in. And so I've now come to view that I've only had one career, which is a career of service, <laughs> you know, and I've been able to do those careers through multiple iterations as a as uh, a soldier, as a lawyer, and now as an entrepreneur. And so uh, I'm a huge believer in the ability of entrepreneurship to unlock human potential and to create things of, of value uh, and of beauty. And so, you know, I'm in a place where I'd like to to take that and, and enable others, right? Um, you know, c- still involved with companies and still growing companies, mm-hmm. but I'm involved with organizations like Bunker Labs, where I serve on the, the national board, right? I, I'm on the board of a think tank. We're trying to create a, a council that sits at the intersection between technology and, and issues of public policy. Um, I'm teaching up at West Point now, and part of what I do is talk to cadets about the linkages between, you know, innovation, entrepreneurship, the law, um, public policy, and and social good, and so um, I'm very fortunate. My my various, uh, you know, my various interests, also known as professional ADD, you know, <laughs> have now put me in a place where I can uh, 
I can kind of tap into all those things in, in various fashions. So I feel very lucky. That's, that's, that's awesome. And again, we, you know, we, when we interview, as we interview the and Ditch Digger CEO, over and over and over again, what do we hear? I mean, the most successful people have found a way to serve others, mm-hmm. you know, way beyond what anybody thought. And whether it's whether it's making sandwiches and, and Jimmy John or it's my friend that started Red Box or your your story, right? I mean, if you if you're the best at serving others and you find something you're passionate about to serve at the highest level, you're going to be successful, and, that, and that's just uh, just the way it is, right? And again, again, all all these things apply, but 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 serving others and and, and uh, is is one of the biggest attributes of a successful entrepreneur for sure. And your your example of that so it's awesome to hear that again, right? Right, Q. Yeah. I mean, how, how neat is that? And uh, you know, when, when you when you think of, I mean, you you've been all over the all over the globe, I guess, right? In Afghanistan, and you, you know, have you been back to your your home country at all? I have not. Uh, that is that is on the list of trips to make. Obviously, um, especially with two young kids, uh, age yeah. of four and two, uh, can't wait to take them over there. So, have you have you been other places in the world? Have you, what other what other place in the world have you been? I uh, spent significant time in Japan. Um, so I'm uh, one of my longstanding uh, passions outside of kind of professional work is I teach Japanese swordsmanship. Mm. Wow! And so yeah, so in between the military and law school, I was what's known as an uchi deshi. Uchi means house, and deshi means student. So an uchi deshi is a house student. It is like a apprentice to a uh, a Japanese martial arts teacher, and so that's what I did uh, for a period of time wow, uh, cool. before starting law school. So you could really kick somebody's butt, like <laughs> <laughs> told you, <It's> not, <laughs> in so many ways. <laughs> no. Okay, so so when you when you've been all over the place and 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 you you've seen the 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 greatness of this country. I mean, you know, when we, I I I constantly you know, I'm, I'm feel so blessed to be able to build a business in this country. You know, what what are your feelings uh, of entrepreneurship and and free enterprise in America? Compared to anywhere else in the world, what are your thoughts? Yeah, we're look. We're a country of um, of diversity, right? We're and all that entails. Mm-hmm. We're a country of immigrants. Um, we're a country that uh, people like myself, right, who came here. You know, my grandma sewed my clothes up through eighth grade, right? I had a blue coat that came from Goodwill that I didn't even realize was a girl's coat until many years later, <laughs> um, and you know. This country gives an opportunity for someone like me to go on and, and serve um, in uniform and then go to go to a place like Georgetown Law School and then continue to serve again. And then when I decided that I wanted to continue service as an entrepreneur to, to start and grow businesses, that's amazing, right? That, you know, this country provides so many opportunities um, and allows all the different people that come from all different walks of life and places around the world uh, to come, I, I I still remember this quote, and I'm I'm struggling to remember who I should attribute it to. Oh, I know who to attribute it to. It's President Reagan. You know, he talks about how if you go to France, you can live there for your life, but you won't really be a Frenchman, right? Or if you go to, you know, Great mm-hmm. Britain, you really won't be, you know, a Britishman. But anybody can become an American, mm. and that's there's something profound in that. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I, I, I agree a hundred percent. Uh, and, and, you know, thanks for your service, brother. I, I, you know, for you to, you to serve and, and, and be in a kind of a, a, a plushy environment and then, and then go back to serving in a, in a tough environment. Man. Um, you know, some people, some people are born with, with some grit and some people acquire grit. You've done both. You've, you've, you've been born in, in, in a, in a gritty situation and came here at a young age. Uh, and then, and then you continually challenge yourself to, to, kind of uh, up up your grit game <laughs> you know and I love it I love it because I think I think it's important in our lives that, that we uh, const- constantly look at you know how do we improve how do we how do we get better and and uh, and grittiness is a great thing and, and I, I think that our, our, you know everybody everybody could use some of that right um, so totally that, agree it's cool um, Q, what else you got, brother? Man, I got some amazing Quentin's true takeaways from today, man. France, oh my gosh, you, you, I'm, I have so many nuggets here. One specifically, hard times produce good times for great character. I mean, if you mm-hmm. think about that, how true that is. One of the even, even, even another one of the things that you said, which is true, and I think every what person, whether you're a startup or seasoned entrepreneur, just don't give up. But knowing when to pivot. You know, I think that I think that's key. And even the rocking chair test. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, live life in a way 
where you have a small list of regrets. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people, are, as they're listening to this, probably like, yeah, man, oh, I wish I should have did this. I wish I should have did that. And I think they're going to think about the rocking chair test more than anything. Um, B people hire C people and A people hire A plus people. <laughs> Man, that right there, that is amazing. You know, um, of course, like you said, you got to be all in in anything that you do. And I think you said it, you hit on the net as far as the quote, you know, if you love the product or service, there are no other options. And again, great entrepreneurs always have a desire to serve. And as I think about you, friends, and, and the one thing, I, I, every time I meet anybody in uniform or anybody who's ever served our country, I always shake their hand and I always say thank you for serving. And I just cannot wait until I'm able to see you in Chicago and see you and so I can shake your hand for uh, for all that you've done because you are a true testament of what duty, honor, and country looks like. So thank you for being a servant leader, brother. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Uh, you, uh, you're the example of, uh, you know, of, of a great American brother, and, and uh, because of you, we can live our, our you know, you and, and those like you, we can live in this in this free country um, as we do. So we appreciate that. Um, can't wait to see you again. Uh, any any uh, closing? Anything closing that we missed, France? Gary, it's it's been great to be on. Uh, appreciate your time. Appreciate all you do, bringing these stories. Um, to life and 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 to your podcast, um, that too is service as well. Um, great, I'm a I'm a believer in the power of stories and, and good storytelling. So thank you. Uh, I I appreciate you being here, brother, and I can't wait to see you in the near future. All right, have a great thank day, you. and we'll hey. see you all next time on Ditch Diggers CEO. See ya. <laughs>